This is a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, which can be divided into several parts. At the top is the deck divided into two sections. This is the landing strip placed diagonally and the steam-powered takeoff platform. On the bridge, there is the antenna and radar system along with the tower air boss to direct aircraft traffic. Just below is the captain's navigation bridge, radar, and radio room. Inside this aircraft carrier is the gallery deck for combat and control operations, which oversee the four phalanx closed combat support systems and the Sparrow missile anti-air defense system. The main deck, one of the largest, houses multiple aircraft and weapon systems. The third deck houses the engineering and electrical shops. On the fourth deck, you will find two nuclear reactors connected to four generators. Although classified, we can assume that the front nuclear reactors power the propellers closer to them, while the reactors connected to the generators power the propellers in the back. But wait, we will also look at the parts and functions of a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier explained in a super-simplified animation. Let's not forget the importance of a carrier strike group, how they operate complete with its heavyweight aircraft fighter jets and helicopters, so stay tuned and don't miss a beat. During flight operations, this deck it is considered one of the most dangerous places in the world to work. There are approximately four large elevators that facilitate the movement of aircraft to and from the hangar bay and flight deck. Each can accommodate two fully armed aircraft. In addition to the four main elevators, several small weapons elevators are located around this flight platform. From this top angle, we can find four catapults for launching aircraft off this moving airport. Together, these catapults can launch one aircraft every 20 seconds on average. Catapults 1 and 2 are situated on the bow. If you look closely, there is a bubble called the Integrated Catapult Control Station. This is a small dome located between catapults 1 and 2 on the bow and left of catapult 4 on the waist. This helps facilitate the launching of fighter jets for the aircraft carriers. As mentioned, this nuclear-powered aircraft carrier utilizes a significant amount of excess steam. So beneath the deck, they are stored in these container, ready for transporting through these pipes when needed. These systems facilitate high-energy expansion through these 320-foot-long tubes, thus powering the steam catapults. Each track features two cylinders that run its entire length. A piston on each cylinder is connected to a shovel extending out from the track. When aircraft is ready for launch, it taxis into position and its nose wheel connects to the shuttle. Upon launch, high-pressure steam is directed into the cylinders, propelling the shuttle down the track at high speed and launching the aircraft into the skies. Furthermore, a water brake is employed to slow down the shuttle at the end of its run, allowing it to be retracted for its next mission. But wait, these fighter jets' exhausts are extremely powerful, so just before takeoff, the jet blast deflectors are raised upward at a 45-degree angle using hydraulic cylinders. This is done to prevent the extreme heat from damaging the high-value assets stationed nearby. Interestingly, this Queen Elizabeth class does not have catapults launching systems. This is also similar to Russian and Indian carriers. Instead, it relies on tried and tested ski jump process to launch its fighter jets. However, what goes up must come down, and this is where this American aircraft carrier stands out. It features not one, but four steel arresting cables, also known as cross-deck pendants, spanning this small moving airport. Upon touchdown, the aircraft's tail hook connects to one of these cables, bringing the aircraft to a stop in approximately 300 feet. That's a significant amount of stopping power for a fighter jet of this size. Just like an airport, they have a flight control island also called the Air Boss. It is from this deck you can have an almost panoramic view. Just below it is the navigation bridge. In simple words, the captain and his crew steer the movement of the $12 billion airport. Moving further ahead is the radar room. All of the data are fed through the electronically scanned array air search three-dimensional radar system with a range of 285 miles, which translates to around 460 kilometers. And this tower here is a two-dimensional long-range air search radar with a range of almost 294 miles. Just below the radar room is the combat direction center on an aircraft carrier. These are specialized spaces that provide information for command and controls for close and support system or the Sparrow missiles. This is the nerve center of the ship, providing processed internet information for command and control of the near battle space. But just a reminder, this is no ordinary internet connection. It has a military-grade data encryption level because you do not want hackers knowing this multi-billion dollar position and reading your classified data. But we as civilians can also achieve this level of encryption by using private internet access. 
Whenever you are browsing online on an unprotected device, such as your phone, computer, tablet, or console, your device is transmitting a great amount of information out into the open, which can be viewed by various entities before reaching the intended website. A virtual private network, or VPN for short, hides your IP address and safeguards your internet connection through an encrypted tunnel. Taking this guy as a reference as he is sailing from America to London, his websites and services across the internet will change depending on his physical location. As you can see, I'm in the UK version of Netflix. To switch to a US server, I just use Private Internet Access VPN. This is a London server, and to switch to a different server, I just have to scroll here and select US Streaming Optimize server, which is going to be used for streaming content specifically. Then go to our web browser, refresh it, and boom, here we go. Netflix US region. But wait, that's not it. You can now use one private internet access subscription to protect an unlimited amount of devices at the same time, just for the price of one account. Go to piavpn.com slash AITelly for an 83% discount on private internet access. That's $2.03 a month and get four extra months for free. Below the combat room is the hangar, where it can accommodate as many as 80 aircraft. Some say this single number of fighter jets is bigger than most countries' air force and navy combined together. Beneath the hundreds of aircraft are the crew mess and ship galley designated areas where military personnel eat, socialize, and sometimes live. This Nimitz class has two crew mess decks, one forward and the other located here. What's even more unbelievable is that it has a mini supermarket for the roughly 5,000 personnel to shop at their own will. But this floating city needs to sleep and the cabin crew is spread all over this floating vessel. Quarters can be found both forward and back of the ship as shown in this visuals. Adjacent to the marine quarters is the engineering hangar for repairing the maintenance hungry jet engines. And the laundry room is located just below it, along with an equipment room nearby. As we all know, the hundreds of F-16 and Super Hornets can consume large amounts of ammunition and guided weapons. To accommodate the Universal Ordnance magazines, they are strategically placed at the bottom of the ship to minimize the risk of explosions, and this storage compartment can extend throughout the entire ships. As you can imagine, this beast is not left unprotected. It can carry two 50 caliber machine guns at the front. Moving a bit further are two felons weapon systems on both sides. Additionally, an anti-aircraft Sea Sparrow missile has been added just close to the phalanx. At the back, you will find Sea Sparrow missiles on both sides and a close support system like the phalanx or the Sea Ram. Inside this close-in support system is the Q-Ban search radar. Just below it is the Q-Ban tracking and gun laying radar, and beneath that is the 20mm Gatlin gun, which spits out 4,500 rounds per minute. All these rounds are fed from the ammunition drum. When a missile speedboat tries to get within a range of about two miles, the close-in support system activates and spits rounds, dismantling an enemy boat in seconds. Due to the concept of fast-flying drone warfare like this one, the Sea Sparrow can destroy it with utmost precision. It has a range of around 50 kilometers, which is 30 miles. With a $12 billion price tag, this aircraft carrier has bodyguards. A typical carrier strike group might comprise of five to seven of these ships. At the center sits the aircraft carrier. These carriers can accommodate a maximum of 130 fighter jets. Flanking each side are four destroyers. They could be the Arleigh Burke class destroyers, predominantly used for anti-air warfare. Leading the battleship at the front is a Ticonderoga class cruiser. These ships are multi-mission covering air warfare, undersea warfare launching torpedoes, naval surface fire support, and surface warfare. At the back is the frigate class, generally serving as a light escort with a focus on anti-surface and anti-air roles, with a lesser degree of capability than larger ships. Depending on the mission, nuclear-powered Virginia-class submarines animated in our recent videos can also be added to the carrier strike group to seek out and destroy hostile surface ships and submarines. A typical carrier air wing can include the Grumman E-2 Hawkeye. This aircraft flies ahead of the aircraft carrier, scanning the battlefield with its large red on radar. Simply put, it acts as a scout, providing early warnings of any enemy activity up to almost 100 kilometers away. They even have a mini cargo plane, the C-2 Greyhound, which they use to transport equipment and personnel. While the six Seahawk helicopters are designed for rescue and anti-submarine missions, these Seahawk helicopters can be launched from a specific part of an aircraft carrier. 
A sonar line is deployed to scan for enemy submarines underneath the ocean water. Upon detection, the helicopter can launch a torpedo at the target. Once launched, the torpedo, equipped with its own sonar system, will actively track and pursue the submarine until it successfully neutralizes the threat. Now this moving city that weighs around 100,000 tons needs to move. They do that with these two nuclear reactors, one positioned at the front and the other situated here. This nuclear reactor is composed of several components. Simply put, this core acts as a miniature sun within the reactor. Additionally, you will find these steam generators and powerful turbines integral to its operation. Let's compare this to a human to help you understand its size. It's important to note that this comparison depends on factors such as the reactor's design, size, power output, and efficiency. This is how it works. Step 1. These radioactive furnaces create tremendous amounts of heat that boil water. Step 2. This creates high-pressure steam that helps spin these giant turbines indirectly powering the carrier's eight electric generators. Yes, you heard that right, not two, but eight general electric generators. This could easily power a city of 100,000 people. Step three, using massive reduction gearboxes, the turbines are connected to turn these four mammoth propeller shafts that drive the ship, giving it a speed of around 35 knots, which translates to around 64 kilometers per hour. But a quick note here, the actual speed is still highly classified. As nuclear physics is a complicated subject, we'll simplify it for you through these animations. A nuclear reactor consists of three crucial components, fuel elements, which could be uranium-235 or uranium-238. These rods vary in number according to the size of the reactor. A moderator, which can be water. Control rods, whose main function is to absorb any excess or spare neutrons in the moderator. Let's see how it works. Uranium oxide is compressed into fuel. Parts of uranium are packed into sealed fuel rods. A fission of uranium begins by bombarding it with neutrons. In each fission, two or three neutrons are released. This in turn causes new fissions, thus creating a chain reaction. However, in a nuclear reactor, it's important that this chain reaction is controlled after each fission. Only one released neutron should cause a new fission. This is how it is controlled. By lowering the control rods, they absorb the oversupply of neutrons. Lowering all the control rods at the same time results in stopping the chain reaction. Now that we have mastered the basic understanding of a nuclear reactor, let's look at the step-by-step -step process. Step 1. The nuclear reactor heats the water to 320 degrees Celsius. Step 2. The pressure regulator is responsible for preventing water from converting into steam. Step 3. High pressure passes through a steam generator. This is where you want to convert water into high pressure steam. Step four, the steam helps turn these huge turbines at a very high speed. Step five, the spinning turbines are connected to these gears. Step six, the gears and clutch then power the electric motor. Step seven, this in turn powers the propellers of this huge aircraft carrier propelling at speeds of around 35 knots, which translates to around 64 kilometers per hour. Step eight, the steam from the turbines is then passed through a motor condenser, which turns it into water. It is then pumped back into the steam generator and the process is repeated, giving it almost an unlimited fuel for this aircraft carrier.